My name is Ofra Tirosh Becker, and I will be talking about Judeo Arabic. And I'm very glad to be here in this series of Jewish languages. And um, so, Judeo, I'll start from the beginning. Judeo Arabic is one of the three most important Jewish languages. Um, it's, a, it's a large group of languages, but the three most important ones are Yiddish, Judeo Spanish, Judeo and Judeo Arabic. Now, Judeo Arabic. Uh, was extend it uh, had the widest geographical diffusion, extending across Asia, Africa, and even Spain in Europe. So almost three continents, over the longest recorded history, nearly fourteen hundred years, fourteen hundred years from the eighth century onwards, until early modern times, it was spoken by uh, more people than any other Jewish language. And it was the medium for one of the foremost periods of Jewish cultural and intellectual creativity, intellectual creativity. And I will show you Maimonides, Rav Sadia Gaon, names that I am sure you have uh, heard of, but we will see what they wrote in this language. So in today's class, I will discuss the Arabic varieties spoken and written by Jews who lived in Arab countries from the Middle Ages to modern times. These Arabic varieties have unique features that reflect the multiglossic linguistic environment that these communities lived in. So diglossia is when uh, two languages serve a, a one community for different um, for different um, uh, purposes. And multiglossia is when you have more than two. For example, the Jews in Algeria spoke Arabic. They knew Hebrew, the Shona Kodesh. But they also had, since the colonization uh, in 1830 by France, they had they knew also French, and they used each language, Judeo-Arabic, Hebrew, and French, for different purposes. Hebrew for praying, Judeo-Arabic among the, the members of the community, and uh, French with the authorities. So this is multiglossia when you are when a community uh, is actually living in a multilingual um, society. So we can divide Judeo, so we can divide Judeo Arabic in three periods. There are some periodizations that were um, offered by um, different scholars. I I prefer to divide it to th uh, three uh, major periods. So the early Judeo Arabic is between the eighth to the tenth centuries, and then the medieval Judeo-Arabic, I will talk about it later in, in details, but first, early Judeo-Arabic, medieval Judeo-Arabic, which is uh, entitled um, classical Judeo-Arabic, because this is the classical period of Judeo-Arabic. We'll talk about it later, and the, between the 10th and the 15th centuries, and then we have modern Judeo-Arabic, from the end of the 15th century, namely the 16th century on till now. And you can see how spread it was, okay? In the 15, uh, if I go back, you see here in the 15th century, in the 10th to the 15th century, most of the Judeo-Arabic speaking communities lived in the region between nowadays Egypt to the West and Iraq in the East and in Spain, in an Andalus. Uh, modern Judeo Arabic um, from the 16th to the 20th century spread all, uh, throughout most of the Arabic speaking world, including North Africa, not in the Gulf, let's say. But in all this area Judeo, where Jews lived, they spoke Judeo Arabic and wrote in Judeo Arabic. If we want to talk about the estimated number of speakers, so these are really estimated numbers. No one can know for sure how accurate they are. But we talk about in the 12th century, in the uh, 12th century, about 50,000 speakers. This is medieval Judeo Arabic. Of course, we don't have recordings from that time, only manuscripts. Then, from the 1900s, estimate the estimated number of speakers is 220,000 people, and today, around 50,000 speakers. People who immigrated from Arab countries to Israel, France, and other places. There are people who are talking, who are speaking uh, the Damascian or from Khalab Aleppo dialect in Argentina or in New York. So they are spread 
uh, all over. Okay, now the names of the language. The speaker's awareness is a very important parameter for the characterization of Jewish uh, languages. When you when um, you ask people who speak Jew a Jewish language, do you speak a different language than your neighbor, the, different than the language of your neighbors? They will probably say yes. We speak a different language, a separate language. Not surprisingly, the names of some Jewish languages explicitly refer to the to the Jewish uh, to their Jewish speakers. You know the Judaism. It includes the Jewish word inside, right? In Spanish, Judaismo, same as Yiddish from Jew, and also Juhuri. In Juhuri, they're all um, include the word Jewish inside. But Judeo Arabic doesn't have a name like that. It doesn't have a, a general name, but we call it Judeo Arabic. But we can find Jews of Tafilalt in Southeast Morocco that they will say El Arabia Dialna which means our Arabic, is opposed to the Arabia, El Arabia del Muslimin, the Muslim Arabic. So they feel the differentiation between their dialect and the Muslim dialect. Or a Jewish Neo-Aramaic from Urmia, they say our language is Lishan Didan. Our language, Lishan Lashon, Lisan in Arabic, Didan, ours. In Algeria, one of my best um, informants, who just died a year ago, uh, he was 92. Just to tell you who, who are the people who still know, the, know these dialects, a very old elderly people. He used to say that they speak Yehudit and the Arabs speak Arabic, right? La Rabia. But we, the Jews, we speak Yehudit, Jewish, like Jewish, but it's not like a common name. It's not Yiddish, everybody knows what it is. We ha don't have a name Yehudit, we have Judeo-Arabic. Now, um, Arabic is a member of the Semitic languages family. Maybe I leave this for a second. So in its West branch, you see Arabic and Hebrew in the, when, when you look at the, this is the Semitic languages family tree. And you can see the Arabic on the left and you can see how far it is from Hebrew, not that far, very close, but not like really, uh, sister languages, right? So Arabic is in the West Semitic language, uh, is a West in the West is a West Semitic language. So of course, Judeo Arabic is also a West Semitic language. Uh, also, from a linguistic point of view, if I go back, you see that I, I wrote here language families as West Semitic language and also Jewish languages. If, uh, from a sociolinguistic socio point of view, Judeo-Arabic is a significant member of the Jewish languages family. When you talk about Jewish languages family, it's not because they have like a, a, the same family tree, that they are all members of a tree of languages, like genealogy of a family, but they share important characteristics that make them a group. From a sociolinguistic point of view, for example, you know that they are written in Hebrew script, most of the Jewish languages, except for some examples that I will mention one concerning the Karai to the Arabic. Then they have Hebrew and Aramaic component. They have archaic features because the communities were, you know, they were living in a, in a closed community. They have heterogenic elements because of the immigrations from one country to another. And they have a shared translation corpus, which I will be talking about later, and a concealed layer of the language to hide from the goyim, from the other people that they will not understand what we are trying to say among us. So all these are features that are shared by the Jewish uh, languages. That's why we can call them, from a sociolinguistic point of view, a family, a family of languages. Now we will talk a little bit about the uh, periods of Judeo-Arabic. So we have early Judeo-Arabic, Arabic, medieval Judeo-Arabic and modern. So the early Judeo-Arabic. Um, first of all, I will say that it is, it is almost impossible 
to say, to determine a precise date for the origin of Judeo-Arabic. Jews were living in the pre-Islamic um, uh, Arabia in the sixth century, and they spoke Arabic. But we know very little of this Arabic, although some Muslim sources, historians sources say, call their language Yahudiya, like Yehudit, Jewish, but we basically we don't have any manuscripts or epigraphy. We, we have nothing written uh, in that language. And besides that, if we check, if we analyze the sixth century Jewish poet, Samau al Bnu Adia, his language was not different from the Arabic of the Muslims, from his Arab poets, uh, contemporary poets. So basically, we don't know about it, but all we know uh, is that probably they spoke a little different and wrote a little different from the Muslims. The Islamic conquest in the sixth and seventh centuries, um, in the eighth centuries, eighth, seventh and eighth, uh, brought the majority of world Jewry under Muslim Arab rule. And they, the Arabic became a um, uh, lingua franca of all the people there, other peoples and the Jewish people. Uh, and uh, like um, Aramaic and Greek were before, but this time for a much longer period. Arabic was the uh, lingua franca for many, many years. Um, so in the first, uh, I'm talking about before the 10th century, during the first two Islamic centuries, Arabic underwent a variety of metamorphoses and it evolved into Middle Arabic. Now, Middle Arabic can be Muslim Middle Arabic, Christian Middle Arabic, and Jewish Middle Arabic. When we are talking about Judeo-Arabic uh, from the 10th century on, it's actually Middle Arabic, okay? We call it Middle Arabic, Medieval Judeo-Arabic. It has different, uh, different names. And what is Middle Arabic? To those of you who know Arabic, it's like uh, Arabic without the cases. Arabic has cases. I don't know if you know what it is. That there are different um, endings to the forms, the, the nouns, the verbs inclined differently. So all these special endings are gone in Middle Arabic. So it's easier, it's easier to study uh, Middle Arabic than uh, Classical Arabic. And um, the literary idiom is different. It's different from Classical Arabic. And a very important achievement uh, was by Professor Blau, who found Geniza fragments. There, were, there are a lot, thousands and thousands of Geniza fragments. Now I'm, I want to say one thing. We used to talk about the Cairo Geniza. Now, recently, um, and Geniza is a place, I hope you all know, a Geniza is a place where you put books and letters and documents that are written usually in Hebrew script and they are torn and you don't want to throw them. So you put them in the Geniza to be kept there. It can be in a synagogue. It can be like in Egypt, in Cairo. Uh, and in, in, it can be in a cemetery. Um, so now we talk about Genizas. Researchers talk about Genizas and not only on about one Geniza. Genizas in, in plural, because uh, a Geniza was found in the rabbinite, uh, rabbinic uh, synagogue Ben Ezra in Cairo, and also in um, Rabbi Sim, Rav Simcha Karaite synagogue in Cairo. And there's also a Geniza that was found in Afghanistan. And it has a lot of uh, very uh, important, um, very important, even Rav Sadia Gaon's uh, uh, treatises. There are fragments of very important treatises written in Judeo-Arabic and Judeo-Persian. Uh, some of them are still in private hands because they want, uh, some of them the National Library of Israel bought, but they, they asked for so much money that it, sometimes it's just impossible. Okay, so Professor Blau found Geniza fragments. Among the Geniza fragments, that are most of them are in medieval Judeo-Arabic, he found um, a fragments, loose fragments, not entire books, that are very old. They're before the 10th century, 
They are written on papyri. They have no colophon. So if you don't have a colophon, you don't, it's anonymous. You don't know who the author is. You don't have a date and there's no place of origin. So all you can see is like um, a few fragments of um, translate, Judeo-Arabic translation of Ecclesiastes or of another uh, book from the, you know, one of the Chumashim, one book of the Torah, but it's only a few pages. There is only one which has a colophon which dates it to 865. So Professor Blau was the first one who published such an important fragment. And what is unique in this um, in this um, in this uh, special uh, early Judeo Arabic and Israel fragments is that they use um, a different system of transcription. They use phonetic transcription, and I will a phonet in uh, Hebrew characters, but it's different from the classical Judeo Arabic script that we knew in Rav Saadia Gaon's writings onward. So it was a real discovery. I always tell my students that, you know, you can have a, a big discovery in, in humanities as well, not only in uh, medical science or uh, exact sciences, right? So it was very important. So here you see the early phonetic Judeo-Arabic script, but I want to show you if classical Arabic has the in the, in classical Judeo-Arabic, they use the um, uh, parallel uh, consonant in a uh, parallel uh, sign, Hebrew sign, with a dot, with a diacritic point. But in early phonetic Judeo-Arabic script, which is the early that Blau was uh, uh, discovered, they wrote with the same letter, you see? Because that's the way they, it, they, hear, they heard it. They didn't know, probably the, the writers didn't, didn't know the classical Arabic script. So they wrote what they heard phonetically. They heard something like Arb, something like De De. What did they do? Write the Dalit with a dot because they felt that it's not a, 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 a simple D. It's a D with something. So they put a diacritic point. And that's different from the classical Judeo Arabic script, which is in the middle. Okay. I know that it's hard to understand when you don't know the script, but I hope you do. It, it means that they wrote what they heard and not they were not um, reflecting the classical Arabic script, okay? But in medieval Judeo-Arabic, what I call classical Judeo-Arabic, not only all the researchers, you see I put, I put classical in parentheses because it's not classical Arabic. It's classical Judeo-Arabic, it's the classical period of Judeo-Arabic in which a lot of uh, literature was written, a very important uh, uh, literature for the Jewish people. And now it was between the 10th and 15th centuries we already said, and the orthography is as follows. In Arabic, we have 28 letters. In Hebrew, we have 22. So there are more letters in the Arabic script. So what did Rav Saad El Gaon uh, and his contemporaries do? They, um, every letter in Arabic, they wrote in the uh, parallel Hebrew letter. When they, but there are six more, right? They said 28. So then they used, you see in a few words, you see a dot above to distinguish between Jim and Rhein, it doesn't matter. You don't have to know Arabic, but what did they do? They, they, um, they added a few dots on six letters to make it uh, possible to distinguish between the letters, okay? So it was not phonetic. This orthography was not phonetic. It was imit uh, imitating the Arabic script. And here is Adi Gaon who lived, you see, between 882 to 942. And he was really um, a leader, yeah, in many respects. He wrote many books, even if he was not the first one to, to write this kind of, this genre of genres of books, he was the leading one. Why am I saying that? Because be, before the, um, uh, the discovery by Professor Blau, 
of the very uh, the very early fragments of uh, Judeo-Arabic translations, it was common to believe that Rav Sa'ad Yagaon was the first one to translate the Torah from Hebrew to Judeo-Arabic. And that was the that was the concept. And now, after Professor Blau in the 80s found fragments of Judeo-Arabic translations, which are earlier than the 10th century, it means that Rav Saad Yagaon was not the first, the first one who translated the Bible into Judeo-Arabic. But still his, um, the, his uh, translation is um, monumental, one of a kind, okay? And you can see here a very nice on the right, you can see here a very nice and very clear manuscript of his tafsir. We don't have an autograph of Rav Saad Yagaon. We do have of the Rambam, but we don't have an autograph of Rav Saad Yagaon. But we, you can see uh, this is a very uh, ancient um, manuscript. It's from probably, doesn't have a colophon, but it's probably from, um, a, a 1008, like the 10th century, the 11th century, just the beginning of the 10th century, okay? Eight years after the 11th century uh, started. So you can see the Hebrew verse and be, be, um, under that, the Judeo-Arabic translation in Hebrew script. And he used the classical Judeo-Arabic script, okay? Not phonetically, but imitating the forms and the, the, the writing of classical Arabic as much as he, uh, as he can. Now you can see also that it was not punctuated. The Hebrew, yes, but the Arabic, the Judeo Arabic was not punctuated. And because it wasn't punctuated, each community could read it in its own tradition. If it was punctuated, some people would not understand the, the, punctu the, the punctuation, right? But this way, each community could read its own translation. And this um, trans uh, translation passed from one generation to another till the 14th century. And then people felt that they don't understand the tafsir anymore, the Sa'ad Yagaon's translation, and they started making uh, new translations. Sa'ad Yagaon not only wrote the tafsir, the translation, it's a tr translation and some manuscripts are, um, the translation is um, accompanied with an exegesis of the Bible. He also wrote other books as a grammarian, as a poet. He had his own Sidur, which people use in different um, countries and different communities and many other books. Now Maimonides, a second uh, Anak, a giant in the in medieval Judeo-Arabic uh, society. Um, I'm sure you know of him. Mimoshe Ad Moshe Lokam Ke Moshe, from Moshe Rabbeinu Ad Moshe Ben Maimon. He was a Jewish philosopher who became one of the most prolific and influential Jewish scholars in the Middle Ages. He wrote all his books except one, in Judeo Arabic, the one that was written in Hebrew is Mishne Torah, Hayad Chazaka. But all the other books were written in Judeo Arabic. This is his handwriting. This is an autograph, an autograph of the um, Mishnah. Um, uh, his, he wrote Kitab Saraj, one of his very large uh, books, was um, not a translation, but a commentary. commentary on the Mishnah, the entire Mishnah. And this is from the Masechet uh, Tractate Avot. Uh, not Tractate Avot, Tractate Shabbat, okay? So I enlarged a piece of the manuscript so you can see this is Maimonides' handwriting. And we have in the National Library in Jerusalem, we also have uh, his autograph uh, to the commentary of the Mishnah. And he wrote, as you know, he wrote uh, also philosophical books, Moreh um, Nevuchim, you know, Moreh Nevuchim, um, Guide of the Perplexed, right? And other um, um, 
writings and also there are a lot of uh, responsa. He was such a, a leader, a Jewish leader that people from all the communities around sent him questions, she'elot, and he would answer. Yeah, we didn't have a WhatsApp by then. So it took time till the letters came to the people who asked to the, uh, he, and, and what is important that it's, um, these, uh, these um, reply, those replies have a lot of, and, and also the questions have a lot of details which help the, the historians to learn about that period of time. Because some, when somebody sent a letter with a situation and he asked a question, he gave all the details because he knew this is the opportunity to describe the, the situation and you have to describe it in all details. So historians learned a lot from this responsa. Now, um, these are Karaite Judeo-Arabic manuscripts. Who were the Karaites? The Karaites were a Jewish sect which broke from the uh, mainstream Judaism, rabbinic Judaism uh, in the ninth century. And they were the, they believed mainly uh, in the Torah Shebe, in the the Nas in the in the Torah in the Bible. Okay, they relied on the Bible, uh, but they they accepted. Um, I can tell you from my PhD and from my the book that I wrote that they cited a lot a lot of rabbinic sources, even if they did not agree with them. But they they knew them. They cited them. And they were, you know, discussing it, disputing over the, the important questions of the new year, the new month, and other people, and other um, topics with their um, rabbinic uh, contemporaries. Um, now you can see what is different here. Karaites in the early times, between the ninth to the eleventh centuries. They were they wrote their writings, Judeo-Arabic writings, in Arabic script. So this is an exception for the so-called rule that all Jewish languages are written in uh, Hebrew script. The Karaites wrote some, some of the writings in Arabic script. And they also, you can see on the right side, these are um, uh, commentaries by Yeshua ben Yehuda, who was a Karaite. A scholar in the 11th century Jerusalem. There was a center, the, the golden age of Karaism was in Jerusalem in the 10th and the 11th centuries. And you can see if you, if you can distinguish on the right side, there are words, Arabic words with punctuation. You see a lot of signs, a lot of signs, some lines like, let me see, even in the second line, Magid Shelo Ayusham Elash Shvakim Chulei, you, you can see words that are punctuated with a lot of marks. Doesn't matter if you can read it or not. But these are Hebrew words transcribed into Arabic script. So the Karaites, when they wrote in Arabic script and they cited the biblical verse or they cited the Mishnah, they wrote it in a transcription to Arabic script and they added the Tiberian punctuation marks of Hebrew and even Babylonian marks and even te'amim sometimes, you know, the, the trop. And it's very interesting. So this is one uh, example on the left side, you can see that the Arabic they wrote in Arabic script, but the Hebrew they wrote in Hebrew script. So they have different kinds of manuscripts. These are in the British library, but they were brought from the Cairo Geniza in, uh, from the Cairo Geniza in the 19th century. And there are lots of manuscripts like that in St. Petersburg that were photographed. They made a digitization, or digitization of it in the National Library in Israel. So now you can, from your own computer at home, wherever you are in the world, you can enter Ktiv, Ktiv in the National Library website and you can see these manuscripts online. Read them, research them, analyze them, whatever you want. So this is very important to know. Over time, in the late 15th century, modern Judeo-Arabic, or more precisely, modern colloquial uh, varieties of Judeo-Arabic 
gradually replaced the medieval Judeo-Arabic. And I said what the, the researchers suggest a few reasons. One of them is that they were, um, the social isolation re increased. The Jews lived in, in their communities in certain neighborhoods, which we call Melah in Morocco and Hara in uh, Tunisia. And there are like the Hara Kbira, the Hara Sria, the small neighborhood, the big neighborhood, it doesn't matter. And also, so this was one reason, reason the social isolation. Then the general knowledge of Arabic, literary Arabic, classical Arabic, um, was declining in the Muslim society as well as in the Jewish society. So they knew the, the knowledge and the education of um, literary and classical Arabic declined. It was not as, uh, as good as it was before in the Middle uh, Ages. And also there was a mass influx of Sephardi refugees from Liberia that came into, um, at least in North Africa. And they also, uh, from the El Andalus, and it also influenced the Judeo-Arabic in many countries. So um, unlike um, medieval Judeo-Arabic, which I said was more like a literary language that it, the, the manuscripts were not punctuated and they rarely, really rarely had colloquial features in them. In the modern Judeo-Arabic texts that we have in manuscripts and later in printed, in printed uh, books are much more colloquial because many um, uh, dialectal features from the spoken dialect penetrated to the writing. So the language of these texts is much more, of these uh, uh, texts is much more dialectal, vernacular. So you see here the, um, uh, you see here the reasons, here I, I have the reason, I see that uh, you have it on the slide. And I will talk now about regional dialects. There are so many Arabic dialects in the uh, Arab speaking world. I mean, Arabic, not necessarily Judeo Arabic, many thousands of dialects. You saw how, how uh, spread is the Arabic language. So naturally there are also a lot of Judeo Arabic dialects and they are being classified into regional dialects. And you can see here, Levantine, Judeo-Arabic in Syria and Lebanon, Iraqi, uh, Judeo-Arabic, Yemenite, Judeo-Arabic in Yemen, Egyptian Judeo-Arabic, and Maghribi Judeo-Arabic. And this is also, there are differences between Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. In all one, they have shared uh, common features, but even from one village to another, you can, you can see the differences uh, in dialects. In the Muslim dialects, now we have to ask about the Jewish dialects, right? Also, another thing that is really important in the, um, this modern uh, Judeo-Arabic, it's more dialectal and also the genres of the, uh, the, the treatises, the books that were published by then, whether in manuscripts or printed books, are more, um, there are a lot of uh, genres, new genres, not only Jewish philosophy and grammar and uh, I don't know, halachic uh, monographs, but also books that you would read for entertainment, uh, folk tales, uh, poetry, mod modern poetry, which we call Qsida uh, on different days. Like in Morocco, Jew Jewish, uh, Jews of Morocco wrote Qsida uh, songs about their neighborhood, about um even about the the dangers um the nature the dangers of modernity which the french people friends uh, brought with it, uh, with it in the colonization time so it was it, more genres and styles were spread at that time now the regional dialects okay so if we want to see the differences between the different groups of the dialects here is Yemenite Jews. Um, you see here a Mori on the left. A Mori, it means a teacher who teaches a student, um, a Yemenite student. 
Now, um, so you see Shnaim Ikra Shnaim Tirgum. We are used to say usually the Jews, the Bible, the verse of the Bible, and then one translation, right? Unkalos in Aramaic or later in Judeo-Arabic, but the Yemenite Jews, they adored Saad Gaon, and they kept, till now even, till, till now even in Jewish communities, uh, Yemenite Jewish communities, religious Jewish communities, uh, Yemenite communities in Israel, they teach, still teach the kids, um, which means they call the, the recite the verse and they know by heart Unkalos, the Aramaic translation, and Rasag, Rav Saadia Gaon's translation. You see, the, it says here, Limut Irgum Rasag Lamikra, it's El Yehudei Teman. And they, it has the Yemenite um, Judea Arabic is different from the other dialects. And it's being researched by uh, people, even in uh, researchers, even in the um, Hebrew University and other places. Now, if we talk about Maghribi Judea Arabic, as opposed to Iraqi Judeo Arabic, just to give an example. So there are differences, and this is an isogloss. I don't know if you know the term. An isogloss, it's like a border that divides the map. When you have one, when you have a feature, a form that is being um, performed in one way in a certain area, geographical area, and then differently in another area, and you can you can see a line, a border between these two areas, okay? In which area, in each area, there is a different pronunciation or a different form. We call it isogloss. Like isotherm when it's a different um, area, a different temperature, okay? Between the different areas. So here you see the most important um, feature that divides between the Maghreb, North African dialects and the dialects of the East. We call it Mashrik. So Iraqi Judea Arabic. When you want to say, I will write, in the Maghreb, you say, Ana Nekteb. People who know Hebrew, I will just say it in Hebrew, as, if, as, it, as you say, Ani Nikhtov. Ani Nikhtov with the Nun. But in Iraqi Judea Arabic, it's closer to classical Arabic and in, or literary Arabic, you say, Ani Akteb. In the Maghreb, like the plural form of the classical Arabic. In Iraqi Arabic, active, closer to classical Arabic. And then the imperfect verb, the inclination for plural is It's like in Hebrew. לא אנחנו נכתוב, not אנחנו נכתוב, אנחנו נכתבו, and in Iraqi Arabic, נכתב, closer to Judeo, to classical Arabic. So this is a major isoclos, major difference between Maghribian Arabic and the Iraqi Arabic. Now, um, when discussing Judeo Arabic and, and the Jewish languages uh, in general, we want to know what is the difference. Okay, you're speaking your own dialect, but what, how different it is from the parallel Arabic um, um, dialect in the same town? Do you speak the same? Do, what is the difference? How, how different it is? is? Is there a, is it legitimate to call it a Jewish, a Judeo-Arabic dialect? Maybe it's not that different. Maybe you just add a few Hebrew words inside the, in the dialect. Let, let's see. So we know we can, we're can. we talking about communal dialects. It, that means how, how different is your community's dialect from other communities' dialects, okay? The fact that you are Jewish, are you speaking, speaking differently than Christian person or a Muslim person in the same town, in the same village, whatever. So first of all, we know that urban dialects, that the uh, Jewish dialects are usually urban. They have features of urban dialects because the Arabic dialects are divided, the, the general Arabic dialects are divided into urban dialects and Bedouin dialects, nomads. Now Jews, 
were usually living in towns, in cities. So usually they don't speak nomad dialects. So most of the Jewish dialects are of course urban dialect, but it will be, um, it's uh, very interesting to know that some nomad um, features sometimes penetrated to Jewish dialects as well because of the influence of the Muslims. But uh, this is for, it's more, for a more detailed lecture. Now, Professor Chaim Blank was also uh, from the Hebrew University. He, he was a brilliant scholar and he found that in Baghdad, there were three separate communal dialects. Baghdadi Judeo-Arabic, Baghdadi Muslim Arabic, Baghdadi Christian Arabic. And the, Ar the Christian Arabic and the Jewish Judeo-Arabic, the Christian Arabic yeah, and Baghdadi Arabic and the, uh, Baghdadi Ju Judeo-Arabic were closer to each other, to one another than the Muslims. And why is that? He, the, he, was, he was really brilliant. He found also, he not only found this, um, an analyzed this situation so brightly, he also found the historical explanation for that. It was because when um, lots of nomads came from the south of Iraq to Baghdad in the 17th and 18th centuries, they were in contact with the Muslims. The Jews and the Christians were living in, you know, closed, isolated communities. So they didn't have any contacts with the nomads, but the Muslims had contacts with the nomads. That's why their Muslim dialect changed. And I'll show you, um, in a minute, I'll show you um, examples for that. So Blanc was talking about communal dialects in Baghdad and he also classified it to, to three levels major differentiation between the dialects, intermediate differentiation and minor. Now the situation in Baghdad is the, the, the brightest um, and clearest example for major differentiation. I'll show you this first, when you want to say I said in Baghdad, if you are Jewish and Christian, you say qaltu, which is very, in, in Judeo, in um, literary Arabic, you say qaltu, qaltu. Now qaltu is very similar. You keep the qa in the beginning, the consonant, you still pronounce it like in literary Arabic, and also the suffix too. In Muslim Baghdadi, they say gelet. You can see that the suffix, the historical suffix is gone. And also the, first consonant is being pronounced ge. And ge is the pronunciation of the nomads. The nomads pronounce, pronounce the ancient ka is ge. So the Muslim who were in contact with the Bedouins, their dialect changed, but the Jews and the Christians kept the archaic form, okay? Also, you see another difference uh, within um, ordinal numbers. Cardinal number, sorry, five. In Judeo Arabic, you say Khamsi. That means in Himala, whoever knows Arabic uh, well, there is a, a um, phenomenon of Himala. In Muslim Arabic, you say Khamsa. So there are differences, major differences between the dialects. So this is a major differentiation Baghdadi Judeo Arabic, Baghdadi Christian Arabic, and Baghdadi Muslim Arabic. Now, there are some places in which the differentiation between Jews and Muslims is only intermediate. For example, Tunis, and when I say Tunis, I mean the capital, not the entire, uh, Tunis not Tunisia, Tunis, the capital. So in um, Muslim Arabic, tha, the, wa, they are still pronounced as in classical Arabic. But in Judeo Arabic, they become the plosives, the, the plosive counterparts, te, de, and de. So you see the difference, if you, even if you don't know Arabic phonology. So in, in Muslim Arabic, you will say also hada, 
but they are, they are Arabic. If the Jews don't pronounce the ha, so they say they would say ada. So they, this is intermediate um, um, differentiation, and minor differentiation could be the um, inter the um, uh, use of a few Hebrew words in an Arabic dialect. Some dialects are not that different. The Jewish uh, dialect is similar, very similar to the Muslim Arabic in that certain city or town or village. And the only difference is that the Jews use the word Shabbat, Rav, uh, I don't know, Yom Kippurim, whatever these words, we'll get back to it. But if the only, the only um, difference is using Hebrew words, or Aramaic words, this is not a big differentiation, it's minor. Okay, so now we're going to, uh, to talk a little bit about language contact. And what I said about Hebrew words connects us immediately to the Hebrew and Aramaic component in Judeo-Arabic. So like in other Jewish languages that you already heard of, and you will probably hear more uh, in the next classes, there are lots of Jewish, um, uh, Hebrew and Aramaic words, components in the Judeo-Arabic dialect. Uh, it has been the same also in medieval Judeo-Arabic. In medieval Judeo-Arabic, you see in the writings of the Rambam and other writers, there are many more writers that I didn't mention, like El Kharizi, Yuda El Kharizi, Yuda Levi, and others, because we don't have time for that. But they also, there were Hebrew words embedded in their writings in Judeo-Arabic. But in the spoken dialects, there are many um, Hebrew um, words. And as we would have assumed, right? Jewish ritual items, so far, instead of shofar, it is um, adapted to the, the Hebrew words and Aramaic words are adap adapted to the Judeo-Arabic phonology, okay? To the way that you pronounce Arabic. So shofar, siddu, sisit, hupa, lulab. Yes, words from the Jewish ritual items. Also the synagogue and tradition, Jewish school, gemara, parasta, hazan. Also names of holidays and the cycle of the year. Rosh Chodesh, Pisach. Pisach is coming. You'll see, I have a surprise for you. Mrila, Megila, Helula. Jewish legal terms. Names for the Lord. It ale shimu laad. It ale shmo laad. So they say it in an Arabic pronunciation. It ale shimu laad. Shim it barach. Hashem it barach. Like in Yiddish, reboyne shiloilim. Yes? We have greetings and blessings. Rifua shilima, bisiman tov, mazal tov. And also regular words not necessarily from the realm of Jewish life. Uriah, which means a guest. Mebul. Ishit Hail, a wonderful woman, right? Hadashim. Hadashim, it means newcomers. From the word Hadash, new. So newcomers who came to the community, they call them Hadashim. They could, they could use uh, an Arabic word, Judud, but they use the Hebrew word. And this is interesting. And also um, a more embedded Hebrew words are actually the verbs. When they take the, <clears throat> it's being uh, naturally that they take the, because Hebrew and Arabic has similar similarities in the um, verbs inclination because they have uh, three consonant roots. In Semitic languages, we have three consonant to each root, right? Ganav, achal, shata, etc. So they can use the Hebrew root. They take the Hebrew root and they um, embed it in the verbal pattern of Arabic. So let's say ganav, he stole. Geneb, instead of saying the Arabic word, srik, that the Arabs will understand that. So what did the Arab neighbors? So they said, Geneb, he stole. They take the Hebrew root, Ganav, Gimel Nun Bet, and it's embedded in the verbal, in the Arabic verbal term. Fawar, 
Geneb is from uh, North Africa. Fawar is from Yemen, from the word Purim. Fawar, it means he celebrated Purim. Piet, Piet, it means he said Piyutim. Piyutim, it's from the word Piyut. We have a different, of, different uh, sociolects in the Jewish community who's, uh, who speaks to the Arabic. There's the rabbinite elite, then the men of the community who knew Hebrew, but not, were not rabbis, worked for the government, whatever. Women and men who did not learn how to read Hebrew. So, and then women. And I have here, in, and then um, I have here a very nice um, example. Instead of saying tu bishvat, which means the holy, you know, the Rosh Hashanah for the trees, tetvav bishvat, they said the women said tub shvat. It's a meta analysis of the word. They hear tub shvat, tub shvat, tub shvat. So they 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 break the the words differently in the wrong way. Tub shvat. Now I wanted to show you here very briefly uh, this um this slide shows you the influence of the languages of the colonies um, on the jews in this uh, uh, area uh, france italy and uh, spain the, and also England, the, the Ottomans, they all, their language is all um, influenced on uh, Judeo-Arabic. And the words from these languages uh, were embedded in the dialects. Here you see, besides the Hebrew words, the Hebrew component, here you see, for example, Italian loan words in, the Libyan, in Libyan Judeo-Arabic, because Libya was conquered by Italy. So you see here, hotel, Italian words, Libagalium Tahu, okay, his his uh, his baggage, etc. Baco from package, paketo, package, bina from penna, a pen, and so on. Just a second. Here I have to show you now the literary journals. I said that in the in the Middle Ages, um the the sciences were um how they say it's short. In the medieval time, uh, Jews wrote uh, mainly about exegesis, philosophy, Jewish philosophy, but also in grammar, but uh, also about um, the new sciences that were developed by the Muslims, right? Geometry, mathematics, and different genres, but it was all like scientific. Later, as I told you, they moved to other genres extended it and they wrote even books for entertainment. Now I want to show you translations in Judeo-Arabic. First, the first example that I have here, this was a really genre that was used in most Judeo-Arabic countries, uh, in most Judeo-Arabic communities, except for uh, Yemen. Because in Yemen, as I remind you that we talked about the uh, uh, adherence of the Yemenite Jews, to the tafsir by tafsir of Rav Sadia Gaon. But here is an example of Sefer Tehilim, Tehilim Psalms, the first chapter, you see here the Judeo-Arabic translation on the left. Now I show you a few different, you see Judeo-Arabic translation of post-biblical uh, literature. Pirkei Avot, what was translated the Bible, Passover Haggadah, Tractate Avot of the Mishnah. Here you see in some places Megillat Antiochus. There was a Megillah for Hanukkah in certain communities. Here you see Chad Gadia. This is for Passover. Oh, you see, this is the surprise I, pro I prepared for you. Wahajedi, Wahajedi, El Dishra Baba, Bizuz Flus. One little goat, one little, I, I'm sure a few of you know the piyut had gadia for Passover. Now another here, another genre that was developed immensely in Judeo-Arabic is the 
periodicals. Only in Tunisia, there were more than 130 Judeo-Arabic periodicals in the 19th and 20th century. The first one was the first periodical in, or journal in Judeo-Arabic was this on the left, on the right side, Ziri, that was published in 1870 in the capital, Algeria. And another interesting thing is that we have a lot of Judeo-Arabic translations of modern literature, bel art, like French novels like Alexander Dumas, The Count of Monte Cristo, uh, The Three Musketeers, uh, uh, Michelet La Fontaine, The Fables of De La Fontaine, uh, The Mysteries of Paris, as you see here, Robinson Crusoe, they were all translated into modern Judeo-Arabic. And I heard from a friend that her father used to read her Robinson Crusoe in Tunisian, in Tunisian translation, in a Judeo-Arabic translation in Tunis. You see also Hebrew novels by Avraham Mapu, Ahavat Zion, The Love of Zion. Yes, Ve'ashmat Shomron. So it's, it's really, you know, um, really exciting. Now, what about this century? So here I show you uh, what we can do th this time. Unfortunately, some of the people that I have uh, photos here, these are my informants, some of them. Unfortunately, some of them are not alive anymore, which means that we really have to do our documentation now and not a minute too late. And so this is one thing we can do if we have speakers very elderly people or younger people, we have to document the length, the dialect. And here you see uh, in Israel, they have here like a theater that have um, shows in Judeo-Arabic, Moroccan Judeo-Arabic. I let you hear a little bit of that. <laughs> وداك الحوات كان جوز مع واحد المراه مكوحه عقيسه نهار كلو مصوت عليه ومعيشته وما بقات معيشه هما كانوا مزلوطين عايشين في واحد برا كتزم قيس and here you see on the right a poster of a show in Judeo Arabic they even have like Molière you know and other shows that they uh, do it in Judeo Arabic and here you see Radio Morocco Israel. There's a station, Moroccan Israeli radio. And on the right, this is uh, Miri Mesika. I don't know if you know her. She's an Israeli singer. Her parents came from Tunis. And in Israel, they started re-celebrating Eid al-Banat, which means the holiday of the daughters. And they celebrate it in, uh, here in Israel, like they used to do in Tunis. In Tunisia. <laughs> 